to say something obvious, but nonetheless, which they will agree with because they've just told you, but overtly about Brandon Elliott, and then they think you're very clever. Well, now I'm just questioning this whole interview. Nah, <laughs> I haven't had the opportunity <laughs> to do it. You know, getting back to your father's family, um, his mother ran away from the family, uh, abandoning him at five. Um, do you think that it was hard for your father to figure out how to be a parent himself because he had no good role models? Like, I mean, it seems like he was a very loving dad, but like he had to sort of figure it out from from scratch. I think that's true. I mean, I think he had bizarrely good role models who were not his parents. Mm -hmm. He had teachers. He had aunts. He had his Irish grandmother. He had these kind of people who stepped into those roles. Half of them were kind of con artists and chauffeurs and dancing girls, but they, you know, but they did the job because it was there and they were decent people. Um, decent people, but crooks some of the time. You know, but not, you know, it's possible to be a crook and not be one. Um, so, but yeah, he had to make it up. But then I think, I mean, I don't care. You always have to make it up. You know, you said that your father was haunted by his, his father. what to make of his father through his writing. And I I was wondering that if in some ways, if your father haunts you not as an unwanted spirit, but because you chose to become a writer, because he's such, he has such a presence as a novelist. Like, when, when you're writing, do you sort of see him looking at, at your work over your shoulder? I hoped in the kind of inevitable kind of corny movie sequence way that when I wrote this book, I would sort of look up from my desk and see him sitting at the chair by the window, kind of, you know, maybe with a kind of Obi-Wan and Kenobi vibe, like, remember the cinema? It's a first ghost. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, and, I, and of course I did. Um, and I'm not sure I even really hoped that I just, you know, it just would have felt kind of movie appropriate. Um, but what I got instead was the companionship of occupying the space that he occupied, the the business of standing and holding the levers of the smiling machine, moving them around. And there is a kind of unity that I get from that, which is incredibly emotionally powerful. And some days it's actually kind of too emotionally powerful. Um, but I'm not haunted by him. I, I'm, even in this benign sense, I grieve occasionally. I mean, doesn't go away. It just gets manageable. Um, you know, but I, when he died, I had this extraordinary moment. Because it was the deep days of, of COVID lockdowns in the UK, and he was in a hospital we couldn't go into. He was allowed in, in because he was ultimately an end of life care. They would let one person in every day, and there were only two people allowed to be on that list, so they called him. And two of my three brothers then were in town. And one of them, Tim, who class is also now dead, um, had a more shaky relationship with him at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to have this extraordinary sort of moment where one of us could go and, and see him and one of us couldn't. And I was like, well, okay, it's obviously you. Because I really didn't have anything that I needed to say or that I needed him to say to me. We had no unfinished business. Um, and I felt that Tim did. Um, and he went in and they held hands. I don't know whether they even spoke, but it mattered to, to Tim, it was, it was important. And I hoped that the next day they would bend the rules for me because there was, you know, anything was possible in that moment, if, if, if you asked nicely enough, because it was obvious what was happening. Um, and, uh, and then he died at 9 o'clock that night. Um, and obviously, on the one hand, I wish I could have kind of said hi and hi one more time however awful that would have been. But I also don't regret the decision once because there was nothing else to happen between us. And your brother Tim passed away a few years after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he, he died by ridiculous medical acts. I mean, not, not in a hospital situation. He, he had a, uh, a pulmonary embolism, I think, right? and, and died um, on hold. So, you know, that, yeah, it was, it was a rough few years. Well, well, we need to take a short break. 
160 local programs to help people live their best possible lives. To learn more, visit TAUW.org. Support for Public Radio Tulsa is provided by Southwood Landscape and Garden Center at 91st and Lewis, offering an open-air shopping experience for all things gardening in a five-acre park-like setting, locally owned and operated since 1982, southwoodgardencenter.com. Public Radio 89.5, KWGS HD1, Tulsa, National Public Radio, Northeastern Oklahoma. This is Fresh Air. We're speaking with novelist Nick Hardaway. He's written a new novel called Carla's Choice. It's set in the world of his father, John Macari Spilos, centered around the beloved spy, George Smiley. Hardaway's other novels include Titanium Noir, Tiger Man, and Melvin. Um, there was a collection of photos. Letters came out um, a few years ago, what's called The Private Spy. And there's one letter to you in this book, and I was wondering if you would, wouldn't mind if I read it. Um, it's terrifying. I don't know which one it is. Okay, well, I don't think it, it doesn't read terrifying. So, uh, but this was on the occasion of your 21st birthday. Um, I don't know if in in Britain turning 21 is, is a big deal as it is in the United States. But is it, it, it doesn't have any legal consequences in it. Yeah. But it's still symbolic. A rite of passage. Okay, so here, here it goes. My dearest Nick, I have had this little candlestick in my work room for the last 25 years, from the last years of my first marriage and all through my second till today. It acquired a corny but real symbolism for me, and in bad times I would shove a candle into it and light it as some kind of affirmation of belief in myself, my talent, my survival. For this reason, I wish you to have it now, with my love, as an antidote to occasional despair. I hope it will remind you that you are a good man and you need a mind me, and your own man and no one else's, and that you have one life only, and no candle ever got longer, and that you have a great spirit and a lot to do, with all my love, David. So, that's a that's a lovely letter. Do you still have that candlestick? I do, of course. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I have it, and, and normally, actually, at the moment, it's, it's in the public, I need to give it clean, but normally it sits on the I said, sure, what do you want? 
had created this extraordinary character, Miss Lala, who was the, the kind of muse of liberty. And she wanted it all written in the voice of Miss Lala. Um, and so it was, it was less about describing the number of clips and buttons and, and how frightfully erotic the whole thing is, and more about expressing uh, a kind of massive joy in the ridiculousness and the beauty and the posturousness of, of the whole thing and doing a kind of um, Eartha Kitt as Catwoman kind of, you know, um, and it was huge fun and it terrifies me that that biography is still out there in the world for you to find. Can you channel a little Miss Lala for us? I, you know, I honestly can't. I can Sounds like the J. Peterman come up from something. Yes, but no, it was so much kind of, oh my God, it's really to understand the sheer iridescent beauty of this place. It's just, it makes me feel so divine. <laughs> and of course, I accept that it was quite fruity, and I'm not sure what we're allowed to say, but you know, it was not very much. <laughs> no, exactly. No, it was about the joy of being liberated to a world of passion. That was the, that was the brief. Of all the briefs, we should all hope for that. <laughs> well, Nick Hargoy, it's been a real pleasure to, to have you on the show and speak with you, and I, I love the new book. Congratulations. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Nick Hargoy's new novel is called Carla's Choice. He spoke with Fresh Air's Sam Brigger. Tomorrow on Fresh Air, our guest will be painter, sculptor, and filmmaker Titus Kafar. He'll talk about his directorial debut, a new movie based on his life titled Exhibiting Forgiveness. It's about a celebrated painter whose world unravels when his estranged father, a recovering addict, suddenly reappears in his life. Hope you'll join us. To keep up with what's on the show and get highlights of our interviews, follow us on Instagram at NPR Fresh Air. Fresh Air's executive producer is Danny Miller. Our technical director is Audrey Bentham. Our engineer today is Adam Staniszewski. Our interviews and reviews are produced and edited by Phyllis Myers, Anne-Marie Baldonado, Sam Brigger, Lauren Krenzel, Teresa Madden, Monique Nazareth, Thea Chaloner, Susan Yukundi, and Anna Bauman. Our digital media producers are Molly C.B. Nesper and Sabrina Seward. Roberta Shorrock directs the show. Our co-host is Tanya Mosley. I'm Terry Gross. from this station, and from Indeed, a hiring platform designed to streamline the candidate's search process. Businesses attract, screen, and interview candidates all from the employer dashboard. More at Indeed.com slash NPR. And from DuckDuckGo, committed to making privacy online simple. Used by tens of millions, they offer internet privacy with one download. DuckDuckGo, privacy simplified. At DuckDuckGo.com. When you really value something, you support it. And there are so many ways to support Public Radio Tulsa. You can become a contributing member, you can donate an unwanted vehicle, or if you're at least 70 and a half, you can make a qualified charitable distribution from your IRA. When discussing your plans this year with your financial professional, consider making Public Radio Tulsa a beneficiary of your IRA distribution. There's a new arena here in Los Angeles using facial recognition for almost everything, about which, hmm. Marketers have to really think about, okay, I can do this, should I do this, how do I do this so that people really welcome it rather than feeling like their personal space has been invaded. I'm Kai Rizdal, a new tier of technology next time on Marketplace. Tonight at 7 on Public Radio 89.5. Support for Public Radio Tulsa is provided by Grand Mental Health, offering options for mental health support and addiction recovery in Oklahoma to help change lives each and every day. Information about services and programs is available at grandmh.com. 
Public Radio 89.5, KWGS, HD1, Tulsa. some seismic shake. Now news. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Janine Herbst. Vice President Harris is once again blasting former President Trump as unhinged and unstable. Speaking in Washington, D.C. today, Harris says Trump's former chief of staff, John Kelly's comments to the New York Times that Trump made admiring comments about Hitler offer a window on who Trump really is. It is clear from John Kelly's words that Donald Trump is someone who I quote certainly falls into the general definition of fascists who in fact vowed to be a dictator on day one and vowed to use the military as his personal militia Kelly a retired marine general who was Trump's longest serving chief of staff is the highest former staffer to publicly denounce Trump the Trump campaign says it's not true and with less than two weeks to go to the elections, both presidential candidates are once again campaigning in swing states tonight. Harris will be in Pennsylvania for a town hall on CNN, and Trump is in Georgia today, attending a faith-themed town hall in Zebulon this afternoon, the rally in Duluth, Georgia, tonight. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin says North Korea sent troops to Russia. They may be headed on to Ukraine to take part in the war there. And here's Greg Myrie reports Ukraine's been warning of such a move in recent days. Austin says the U.S. now has evidence North Korean troops recently arrived in Russia. He says the U.S. is still trying to determine if those forces will soon be sent to Ukraine. Austin spoke to reporters in Rome following a visit Monday to Ukraine where he promised additional U.S. military support. Ukraine has been saying for days that 10,000 or more North Korean troops were in Russia and headed to Ukraine. Austin says if this is accurate, it suggests Russia's war effort is facing increasing difficulties. Russia has sent large numbers of troops into Ukraine where they've suffered massive casualties. Greg Myrie, NPR News, Washington. The government is ordering Apple and Goldman Sachs to pay $89 million for failures related to the Apple Card. And here's Laura Wamsley has more. Apple and Goldman Sachs launched Apple Card in 2019. But the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau says customer service for the card was a mess and ordered the companies to pay millions in penalties. CFPB says the companies failed to process disputed transactions, so cardholders were unfairly held responsible. To investigate the disputes Apple did send, damaging users' credit reports. And customers who were promised interest free financing on Apple devices were, in fact, charged interest. Goldman Sachs and Apple say they worked diligently to address the problems, though Apple says it disagrees with the characterization of its conduct. Laurel Wamsley, NPR News. Wall Street sharply lower by the closing bell, the Dow down 409 points, NASDAQ down 296. This is NPR News from Washington. 404 here at KWGS News. Good afternoon, I'm Ben Abrams. Mayoral candidates fielded questions about Tulsa police practices at last night's debate. In a question to the candidates, Oklahoma Eagle managing editor Gary Lee noted black Tulsans are subjected to far greater arrests and uses of force than white people. Candidate Karen Keith said she used her relationships with Tulsa's police chief and the Fraternal Order of Police. I will be working hand in hand with them to make sure that these discrepancies are addressed. Candidate Monroe Nichols said officers need to build trust with Tulsans to lower the racial disparity. We really have to get back to the community police and we have to not only hire more officers but also make sure those officers are really part of the community. You can listen
listen to the full mayoral forum on our website, publicradiotulsa.org. We must note the University of Tulsa hosted the debate and holds the broadcasting license for this station. The downtown Tulsa Farmer's Market is going to the dogs. Tonight, the iconic Oscar Mayer Wienermobile will be making an appearance until 7 o'clock at Chapman Green. Hot dogs from the Smoke Boss will be on offer. Your pup is invited, too. Next week marks the final market of the season with a Halloween theme. Costumes are encouraged, and prizes will be awarded for the best outfits for adults, kids, and pets. For more details, visit downtowntulsa.com forward slash market. This is KWGS News on Public Radio 89.5. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include EBSCO, supporting open source technology and making open platforms possible for libraries of all sizes. Learn more at EBSCO.com. And listeners like you who donate to this NPR station. A burn ban is still in effect in Tulsa County as well as some surrounding counties due to dry conditions. Tonight we'll see mostly clear skies with a low around 63 degrees. Tomorrow we're back up into the 90s with sunny skies and a high near 91. Wind gusts as high as 30 miles an hour. Tomorrow night a 20% chance of showers and thunderstorms after 10 o'clock. Otherwise mostly clear with a low around 65 degrees. Friday more sunny weather expected. This is All Things Considered from NPR News. I'm Elsa Chang in Culver City, California. And I'm Juana Summers. Here's a quotation. I need the kind of generals that Hitler had.